last but not least, uh, uh, if you put the term Loller in, on Google, you are going to find the name Dan as the uh, next to it. While Dan, uh, with the, his modesty, has claimed that he did not invent this word, for sure he is the person who has coined the term uh, Loller uh, in, uh, I would say, in economic uh, uh, books and in, in, in the history. Dan, uh, welcome to the American University in Dubai. Thank you for being with us and uh, the floor is all yours. Well, thank you very much for um, inviting me. It's, a, it's an honor. I've actually given a lecture uh, there a long, long time ago, back when I was living in Dubai. And so it's a pleasure to be back. Um, I, I guess I, I'm going to assume that some of the people on this call don't know the history of the Lebanese crisis. So I will, I will, I might be repeating some things I've said before just for the benefit of those people. Uh, one of the things I want to start with is myth, myth busting on the crisis. And you know, there, there's a lot of people, very smart people, very smart analysts that missed the, the, the crisis or ex, at least missed the exact manifestation of the crisis. And there's a reason for that. And this is kind of important for academic institutions like yours. The problem is that we all study in the same type of universities, the same type of uh, courses, the same macroeconomic courses. And therefore we have some uh, preconceived notions on how to, how to analyze stuff, which sometimes uh, makes us miss the obvious. So for example, uh, one of the terms that all the analysis about Lebanon talks about even today is the debt to GDP ratio, uh, GDP growth. Uh, if it's high, it's good. If it's uh, shrinking, it's bad. This is always sort of the cliches, the macroeconomic cliches that everyone talks about. So if we looked at the debt to GDP ratio and all the reporting, even today, I get these questions from, uh, from analysts that we are the third most indebted nation. Our debt to GDP ratio is 150%. Uh, and that was the, the conventional wisdom before the crisis. And so there were two items that everyone was looking at. One was the devaluation of the lira, which, is, which was kind of obvious, uh, uh, even to people that are, you know, that are convinced about the Lebanese miracle. And the other one is about the defaulting on, on, on government debt. Again, it, it seemed obvious to a lot of people, but the, what was missed is the Lollar concept or the devaluation of the Lebanese dollar or the US, the US dollar in, in banks in Lebanon. That's the part that seemed to have been missed by a lot of people. A lot of, I mean, if you look at the dollarization rate in the banks, what that told you is that, you know, on average, today it's much higher, but on average, it was two thirds to 70% of people didn't trust the lira. And therefore, they placed their deposits in the perceived safety of the US dollar in the banks, not realizing that if there's, if there's not a real dollar backing it, then you, all you have is a claim or a, an ownership of a piece of paper. So this sort of was uh, the main crux of what was missed in the, in the whole uh, uh, development of the crisis. So let's talk about the debt to GDP ratio a little bit to bust that myth. So the debt to GDP ratio usually is quoted to be 150%. $90 billion plus or minus is, the, is, the, is what's reported as the debt. So that 90 billion or 92 billion, 31.3 of that is Euro bonds. That's dollar debt. The rest is uh, Lira debt, 60 billion. So even if we, even if we took, uh, you know, even if we took the Euro bonds today after default, uh, they're worth, they're trading in the market at 15 cents today. So that's worth four and a half billion. So even if we took the, the euro bond debt as, uh, as a total amount, even though part of it is internal, meaning uh, would be resolved within a in-country uh, restructuring, uh, the lira debt is now dropped by, by five sixths. So in reality, the lira debt is worth maybe 10 billion. So our total debt, if we were to do a restructuring, you're talking about between 12, 15, maybe $20 billion. So Today, our debt to GDP ratio is at most 100%. And if we, if we separate the debt between foreign and domestic debt, uh, our debt to GDP ratio falls below 100%. In other words, by doing nothing, nothing at all, we've kind of resolved 
a large part of the problem, assuming that that's where the problem is. Of course, that's not where the problem is. The problem is the debt uh, with the central bank, which was not, which was totally underreported in all the pre-crisis media and pre-crisis analysis. So what's the debt in the central bank today? It's $108 billion, according to the last report. That's, of course, lira and dollar. We don't know the exact amount of dollars because uh, the central bank doesn't break it down, but we can estimate it to be about $80 billion. So if the, the dollar deposits today are about $112 billion, that's the last report I've seen, effectively, uh, most of the deposits were lent to the central bank. Now, where did the money go? If you, the, the best answer for that is to hear what the governor of the central bank, Riyad Salemi, has said. He answered that question at least three times in the last few weeks, once with uh, Hadley Gamble from CNBC and once with Bassam Abu Zaid uh, in his interview when he, was in, uh, when he was still in Dubai. And the answer to that question, he said that he never lent, one of the myths, by the way, that we want to bust today is the fact that depositors lent the central bank money, the central bank lent the government those dollar deposits. So everybody thinks that the dollars were lent from depositors to central bank, the central bank lent those dollars to the government, the government wasted them. That's sort of the conventional wisdom or stereotype in Lebanon. Of course, Riyad Salemi answers that question. He says, no, I didn't lend the government any dollars uh, I, because I, I lent them lira. The government spends lira. I lent them lira and I'm the issuer of the lira. I print lira. So where did the money go? Asks Bassam Abu Zaid and Hadley Gamble. He says it went towards imports. What are imports? So imports are divided into two parts. One part is the lira peg. So every Lebanese person, uh, both in the private and public sector, I think the public sector gets uh, too big a rap sometimes. Uh, every lira salary, whenever somebody bought a car, an iPhone, a vacation, etc., that effectively, if we if we uh, simplify that that transaction, that person went to Riyad Salemi. Riyad Salemi gave him dollars. That person went bought the thing. The dollars went outside Lebanon, never to be seen again, in return for some type of a consumption action. So that's where the dollars went, or the electricity company, or whatever. So effectively, all of this stuff, uh, the majority of it, we don't know the exact number, by the way, which is why we're demanding a forensic audit. But I would estimate at least conservatively 50% of uh, dollar deposits were spent on imports or the lira peg. That's a very conservative estimate. I would even make it more like at least two thirds, maybe 70%, uh, even higher, probably maybe 80 or 90%. And the rest, whatever that is, the rest went on uh, what I call Ponzi interest. So if somebody went in in 2016, earning say 31% interest on US dollars uh, by doing a, some type of a financial transaction uh, with, uh, with a bank, if the person went in with 100 million and left with 131 million, that 31 million dollars was financed with the what's called the reserves, or in other words, was financed by other people's deposits. Now, uh, to summarize what was going on though over the years, effectively what that's saying is that every Lebanese citizen earning a lira salary was living a lifestyle that was a higher standard than the productivity of the country. So for example, in the United States, when the per capita GDP is say $60,000, it's because the United States produces a lot of stuff that people wanna buy. If Germany is richer than other countries, it's because they make good cars and so on. In Lebanon, we had a higher lifestyle than our neighbors uh, and you know, uh, because of the peg. The peg gave us a salary that was much, much higher than we, we let's say earned by virtue of what so something that we produced. Now this system was okay and it, it functioned for a long time because the, the, the expats mainly, FDI, tourism sort of compensated for this balance of payment deficit. So the major problem in Lebanon was the balance of payment deficit, not the fiscal deficit, the government deficit as, as a lot of people repeat. It's the, the balance of payment deficit. It's dollars, much more dollars flowing out than coming in. So that stuff was compensated for by namely, mainly expats sending money. But at some point, it was no longer enough. Our GDP per capita grew so much that that was no longer enough. And we started to dip into our savings, namely uh, uh, deposits in the banks. And deposits in the banks, if we were to analyze them, uh, I like to describe the LOLAR uh, in the bank. I'd like to, to compare it to gold. You know how you have 14 karat gold, 18 karat gold, 
like which reflects the purity of gold. And the same way there's a purity of dollar in the banking sector. So for example, somebody like you guys, the professors here, earning dollars in Dubai or dirham, which becomes dollars, and sending it to Lebanon, the purity of that $100,000 you sent to Lebanon is 100%. That's pure gold, so to speak. If the bank paid you 10% interest, so your 100,000 turned into $110,000, the purity of that amount, the 110, is no longer 100%. It's now 90% because the 10,000 is, uh, is lolar. It's made up money. On the other hand, a government employee retired who just was paid 100, uh, 150 million lira, who, who converted it to dollars, 100,000, the purity of that dollar is 0%. So in any, in any solution, one has to look at these uh, idiosyncrasies of how the dollar came about. Of course, this is pure mathematical economical analysis. There's also the political angle. You know, obviously, you can't go to a retired army officer and tell him your dollar is not real, right? Whereas uh, uh, Maysan's dollar is real. So the solution, in some ways, has to look at that stuff. And it's at the intersection of what's politically palatable and what economically is just or makes sense mathematically. Uh, I think, I don't know, you guys want me to go on or take questions now? Uh, if you have any question, maybe you can uh, ask in the chat box. Otherwise we can continue and leave the Q and A if you want Dana till the end. Okay. So I'll say okay. one more thing about the I'll say one more thing about the solution. So the solution, the, the good news about the problem, there's a couple of pieces of good news. One of the pieces of good news is that unlike some of the uh, predictions about the Venezuela scenario and all that, the, the nice thing about Lebanon is the fact that it's actually people like a lot of you on this call. The 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 um, the number of expats outside the country is humongous per capita. Uh, my estimate before the crisis was that there was, and here, let me define what an expat is. I, I don't define, for example, Senator George Mitchell or John Sununu in New Hampshire. Those guys are not Lebanese expats because they don't visit Lebanon and they don't send money to Lebanon. So out of the tens, sometimes they, people quote 10 million, 15 million, out of those 15 million are not really expats or not relevant expats. In the same way that Sylvester Stallone is no longer Italian or Frank Sinatra is no longer Italian. They're no longer, other than the name, they're not relevant to Italy anymore. However, uh, people like you uh, are relevant if you, vis if you visit Lebanon once a year or if you send money to Lebanon, that's what I call a relevant tax expert. I estimate those before the crisis at about a million. And I won't get into how I estimated that number, but uh, the, the relevant expats are one million and which means that there's out of every family of four and a half people, there's a guardian angel. I've said this for the last year, year and a half. There's a guardian angel out of, you know, for every family in Lebanon. Of course, some families have zero guardian angel, which means uh, another family has two. But statistically speaking, that's the average. And these are people that are sending, uh, you know, last estimate seven billion dollars. That's not a, a trivial amount of money. And then there's another 500,000 that I estimate will come online. These are people that weren't earning a lot of money or earning something like 1,000, 1,500, $2,000 a month. Two years ago, if they offered their parents uh, to send $500, uh, you know, uh, uh, sorry, they can't afford $500. So if two years ago they offered $100 of remittances, the, their parents would have said, you know, why don't you just keep that stuff? We don't need it. And even $500 a month, which is a little bit close to the average before, in the uh, two years ago when the per, our per capita income was large, uh, that was the difference between somebody going to, you know, going to music hall two or three times a, a month versus not. Today, $500 feeds a family very, very well. So back to the extra 500,000 that will come online. Today, sending $100 is, is one, one and a half times minimum wage. So that makes a difference. So that means that there were hundreds of thousands of people that didn't send money before that will st start sending money now. And this is why, not surprising to me, by the way, but there's a lot of people why the remittances were so high. Uh, yeah, I think I'll leave it here because I don't want to, I don't know if I'm, what I'm saying is interesting to most of the people. I'd rather take the questions and make it more interactive. Uh, Dan, I would like to start, uh, to start uh, asking. So basically uh, for banks, for the central bank, 
there is on, a, on an annual basis audited financial statements, okay? And uh, all audit opinions were, were, were almost clean. So why did audit, why auditors did not highlight this, this, uh, this risk, this exposure? Where was it hidden actually? That's a, that's a very good question. And, and we've seen cases like this happen before. You, you've got to remember that a lot of times, first of all, I don't think there was outright lying in the audited statements, okay? You have to remember that uh, like everything in life, uh, out of the box type of interpretations and thinking is what is considered uh, value adding, right? So if, I, if I'm dealing with you, my son, for example, you know, let's say I've known you for 20 or 30 years, and I've been doing business with you in some type of fashion, right? And I like you and I respect you. So at some point in time, you might need me in some way. And, and we might even work together in a certain interpretation. It doesn't necessarily mean I'm doing something immoral, but there's slippage that occurs, you know what I mean? Because of the familiarity issue. This is one of the reasons, by the way, that, that people ask. This is one of the reasons that uh, like in, uh, in um, political appointments, they don't allow you to stay more than three years in term limits. Ambassadors, for example, you notice how ambassadors, they make the move every three years. There's strict limits on the stuff because of this familiarity thing. If you get too familiar with something, you start to uh, make a mistake. In banking, uh, when I was in banking, they had compliance rules, one of the compliance rules. And they, by the way, they found that out in every single uh, fraud at a bank. They found out that the person never took vacations. So, of course, in a company, before the fraud is found, people look at this, oh, this is a hardworking person, never takes a vacation. In reality, the person never took a vacation because that's when you bust the person, like Jerome Kerviel, et cetera. Every after-action report talked, talked about, you know, this uh, mandatory rule now of making every banker take two weeks off with somebody else covering them. And this is exactly how things are caught. So when you have the same auditor, both company and person doing the same audit, uh, you know, in a while, slippage happens like in retrospect people start looking you know and like oh my god what did i do but at the time they think they're just being and uh, me i'm being nice to my son right so back to the issue of the audit i don't think there was outright fraud in the audit there was a lot of gray okay and the reason i say there's not outright fraud is because there's a lot of the statements by the central bank that are actually hidden they're not published the, the central bank publishes every two weeks the balance sheet a very um, let's call it superficial type of uh, uh, balance sheet. So if somebody were, you know, if somebody who's lying just publishes everything, right? Somebody who's not lying tends to, to want to not publish the stuff. So, uh, so I like other, you know, like if you look at where the where the losses are hidden in the in the central bank uh, uh, report, it's under what's called other assets. There's a guy who who's now a uh, he works for one of the auditing companies in Dubai, Andy. He's the guy who. I've, I've got a bit of an intuitive thing. Like I, I, I didn't feel the numbers were accurately reflecting the risks, but Andy went in and, and analyzed the stuff very technically and very precisely, okay? Uh, but uh, the bottom line is that I think it's, it's all about that. It's all about the familiarity event, just like anything in life. You start to get, you start to slip into, into mistakes when, you, when you're too familiar with the person, when you like them, when you have a long-term relationship and you don't realize that what you're doing is violating your fiduciary duty to the people you publish those reports for. Okay. Uh, Dan, before I take, take questions, I still have two more. Uh, based on what econ the economists, also the governor of the central bank was always saying that uh, the lira is okay. Based on what? And here I'm talking about uh, professionals and people with, uh, with experience. So based on uh, what? Well, the governor, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you something surprising here. The governor had no choice but to say that. In fact, if mm. you or me or any of us here were the governor, we would say exactly the same thing. Because if you ever hesitate in that position, it's game over, right? So I don't think we should, you know, we should focus too much on that. The problem for me, the issue isn't whether he said the lira is okay or not. The issue more importantly is where was his money? You know what I mean? Not, I'm not picking on him personally, but I'm saying that, you know, when you are in an official position, you have to speak in a certain way. In the same way that you guys representing, for example, your university, you, you have to speak in a certain way because you represent the institution you're in. In the same way, the governor, because of the effect he has on the market, has no choice but to say that. Because as, if he says something like this, look, I'm not sure if I can hold the lira, but I'm going to try my best. If he says that, next day, everybody sells the lira, right? 
So uh, that's, uh, in my opinion, uh, that we can't blame him for that. What we can't blame him for, and again, I'm not accusing him, and I don't know if he's done that or not. If his money was outside Lebanon, if his money was, was not in the lira, while well, he's saying you should put your money in lira, then there's a, a issue there. With a, you know, there's an issue there with the skin in the game and and uh, uh, hypocrisy and so forth. But again, I'm not accusing him. I don't know if he did that or not. I'm just giving you an example here. Same thing, okay. uh, the, uh, the economists that were looking at it too, you, you also have to remember, back to the familiarity thing, you have to remember that this, this man was looked at as a saint uh, by all the smartest people, by bankers, etc. And he had a track record to prove it. I mean, the, the system kind of worked, kind of worked for 27, 28 years, right? So uh, the, the, there's, there's such a, fantastic track record that was very difficult in fact even i when i first met him in 2013 i was i was in awe i, I had a lot of respect for him uh, in some ways i still do i think he's a very smart individual uh, i just when when the financial engineering stuff stuff started happening in 2016 i felt something was wrong and that's when my criticism started about policy issues not personal issues of course uh, and uh, i if you noticed if you go back to my writing my 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 criticism 99% of it is about the policy decisions that was that were made in the in the financial engineering transactions, which created a lot of moral hazard. So this is another one of those issues. Uh, I think if we had to analyze what happened in Lebanon, the crisis in Lebanon, and we had to uh, blame it on one thing uh, from an academic perspective, I'd say moral hazard. There was a lot of moral hazard created. There was a lot of people that were benefiting from continuing the Ponzi scheme. And there was not enough downside on a personal level of people that were in positions of authority, which uh, allowed this thing to, be, to snowball and become much bigger. Uh, Dan, uh, okay. there, there are many questions in the chat box, but I have a quick question before my son starts uh, taking the audience's question. You know, for, for an economy to boost back in general, the, the local industry, manufacturing industry has, has, has to, to start growing. Now, let, let me just take one sector in Lebanon. Let's say the, the, the food manufacturing industry in Lebanon. Okay, I'm not going to name companies uh, right now, but do you see prospects for these companies to survive what we're going through right now and even more to grow? Um, I, I think there has to be a Darwinian uh, survival of the fittest. I mean, companies, and this is true, by the way, in any country, in any industry, but in Lebanon, it is more, it's more pronounced. I'll tell you in a second why. But companies that adjust to the new realities and are able to evolve will survive and do well. Companies that don't will not. Now, one of the problems that we had in Lebanon, because of the, because of the subsidization, monopoly power, uh, the PEG and other things, it created a lot of bad habits and it created a lack of ability to compete on many fronts. You know, what I'm saying there was a lot of uh, like I said, like a monopoly. I mean, uh, you know, if you have a monopoly in Lebanon, you know, what's called the sole proprietorship, right? You're not used to compete because people have to buy that brand from you or they have no choice. And if you have protections, meaning that if you were to bring in the same product from overseas, you might get legally uh, snagged or uh, taxes or what have you, then you, you can you can stay relaxed. You're not used to competing. So I think that one of the advantages of the system, what's happening now is that companies are going to have to learn to adapt and compete uh, in, a, in a way that where they either will do well and survive and prosper or they will cease to exist. So to answer your question, if we can produce a product that is superior quality at a lower cost, any company that does that will do well and prosper. And that's a good thing for the Lebanese economy. And any company that cannot do that will no longer exist. And that may not be a, such a bad thing. So, you know, the economy has to evolve into, a, into an, a, 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 an economy that is able to compete worldwide against the, all the other countries that are, that are there. Thank you. Hi, Dan. Just to add to that, a bit off topic, do you think the way the black market was working with the manager check for manager check outside the country saved the banking problem in general? Uh, I'm not sure I understood the question. You're talking about the, uh, you know, the discounted checks and stuff like that. Yeah. So the, uh, the okay. black market okay. was actually doing 31%, for example, and they'd give you another check in Dubai for the amount. Yep. 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 Uh, for sure. The, I mean, this is not the best solution. So the solution that, uh, I like 
is what I what I uh, you know what I call the equitable distribution of losses. Uh, I'm not the first guy that came up with that, by the way. Sharb al Nahas did, so give them credit here. The equitable distribution of losses. And yani today there are massive losses, and it's all about allocation of losses. So there's two ways of doing this. You can either equitably allocate losses, or you can allocate losses to what's happening today. So how are losses being uh, allocated today? Part of it is what you're talking about, the voluntary, uh, you know, people doing a haircut on themselves, a, a pre-haircut. You know, these, these are people that are assuming or have made a, a determination that the haircut will be larger than 65%. Therefore, they have opted to sell their, their account for 35%. So this is one, one way it's happening. And it's fine. Voluntary, you know, voluntary uh, decisions are always a good thing. That the other one is involuntary. So the other way they're doing it by printing lira at 3,900 and paying the deposits the way the way that they're doing at the central bank. This is effectively distributing the losses over every person in Lebanon earning a lira salary. The disadvantage of that is it's distributing the losses of what should have been on a few thousand people to four and a half million citizens. Okay. Uh, but the answer to your question, it is one solution. It is a Darwinian solution. One of the, one of the problems with, the, with this solution is that deposits have, have diminished or have been reduced from $180 billion at the height to today less than $140 billion. Yet dollar deposits have only dropped from $120 to $112 billion, meaning that because of, they've allowed conversions through WASTA and other ways from uh, do, from lira to dollar at fifteen hundred, people thinking they saved their dollars that way. The li the claims or the liabilities haven't actually gone down that much, despite this huge move uh, in deposits. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, so let's take some questions from the audience. So let's start with Eli. Uh, Dan, you mentioned on multiple occasions that you you estimate the real value of lira USD to be. 5,000. Can you please shed some light on how you got to that? Uh, yeah, the the, yeah, the, the 5,000 uh, level of the lira uh, that I used before is this depends on uh, assuming uh, the balance of payment is zero. Okay. So what I do there is I project, I say, okay, if we were to reduce the balance of payment to zero through, you know, through unnecessary seepage of dollar outside the country, what is the definition of unnecessary seepage? Uh, things like the domestic helpers, uh, foreign workers. And we have hundreds of thousands of domestic helpers that at the height were sending something like $4 billion. So you expats were sending in 7 billion. We were sending out 4 billion just on domestic helpers and uh, stuff like that. So in other words, Yane, if people like you sending $500 a month to your parents, they were spending it on their domestic help. <laughs> to, to make it uh, to make it easy so if we if we tax those things and, it, and it, let, i'll give you an example in the us minimum wage is 15 dollars right now imagine they say minimum wage is 15 dollars for americans but you could always uh, bring in a mexican or african or, or middle eastern to do this to do any blue collar job well, what happens then the 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 all the all the you know all the americans with passports will get displaced and they get replaced they get they get replaced uh, by uh, uh, you know uh, foreign people, okay. So uh, uh, in Lebanon we did the same thing. We said okay, any medial job like picking up trash, uh, filling up the car with gas, etc. We, we allow foreigners. Yani, today if you tax those, you say okay, you want to bring in domestic helper, fine. Uh, I'll tax you five thousand dollars a year on it. Now, what does that do? That would reduce them by ninety percent. 95% and replace some my Lebanese doing the same job. It means the salary is a bit higher, perhaps, perhaps not. Uh, but that's one way of reducing the dollar uh, seepage. The other way is taxing uh, V8, you know, big cars, V8, uh, Range Rovers, Cadillac Escalade, et cetera, making it as expensive as, as Singapore. If we do all those things, okay, uh, then the, the balance of payment becomes zero, okay? And then the Lira PPE value, PPP value, sorry, would be uh, uh, something like 5,000. This assumes, of course, you, you no longer print lira to pay off deposits. You, know, you, have, to, you have to have a more uh, surgical solution, if you know what I mean. Uh, okay, another question for Elia also. What would be the dollar purity if we enter an IMF program for $3 billion and execute part of the dra uh, draft of government plan? Okay, so the the... 
I, I'm not one of those people that believes that the IMF is sort of like this magic wand that's going to solve it, neither in the amount of money they're going to allocate to the country nor in anything else. I like the IMF because they provide adult supervision in the absence of proper uh, responsible leadership in the country. We've clearly shown in, in the various governments, in the parliament, et cetera, in Lebanon, that we, you know, we don't know how to run a country. This has been, this is obvious, obvious. So I think that what the IMF provides is IMF comes in and tell, you know, says, I'm going to give you a bit of money and you got to do X, Y, and Z. The problem is the assumption of how much money they're going to give us is, is, is actually exaggerated. And if the IMF might give us one, one and a half billion dollars a year uh, max for the next, let's say three years, which is not a game changer. So that's not where, where the advantage is. In fact, one of the laws that I'm supporting in parliament today, which is the return of funds that were uh, surreptitiously, that surreptitiously escaped by people with super wasta, especially during the time when banks were closed. Uh, I, I can give you some numbers here. Between three and four billion dollars uh, got out of the country in those few weeks when the banks were closed. This is all super wasta. That's more than the I, that's that in one shot we can get more than the IMF is going to give us if we just you know with a with a stroke of a pen if we pass that uh, law in Parliament. Uh, so uh, if we if the losses are distributed to the top percentages, if clawbacks yani, with a return of illicit money, money that escaped uh, surreptitiously, is brought back. Then you can get to uh, you can get we can get back to a purity of dollar for the smaller accounts, or in fact to, for all accounts. Okay, after losses are taken and distributed, and if you if you if you remove the the claims of the 112 billion and make them equal to what dollars we have, then it's or a bit more, let's say, then uh, it's it's done. There's no there's no need for a lolar. Lolar becomes a dollar again. Okay, Dan, so another question from Mo. How long the dollar will continue to exist uh, in the Lebanese financial system? And what will be the fate of those dollar digital figures in the Lebanese bank? So again, fork in the road. If we do what we, if we knew, do what needs to be done and we distribute the losses in an equitable fashion, then the, the dollar can uh, end, can, can die a, a honorable death. And, uh, uh, you know, they, the accounts can become dollars again. If we don't do it that way, like we continue the Darwinian solution that is now being uh, designed by the central bank, yeah, and a print lira, and let's do it that way, and voluntary haircuts. Uh, I think that the, the, there's going to be a magic transformation when loans, yeah, and today the, the, somebody was asking about the discount checks, selling the discount checks. So why are these discount checks being sold? Where are they going? Okay, so if I have a million dollars in the bank, lolars, yani, I sell them to a guy who buys them for say 350,000 US dollars or 300,000 US dollars. Why is that person buying my check? The reason is that person has a loan at a bank. So your loss as a depositor is my gain as a debtor. So it's the exact opposite of what your grandfather and grand my grandfather used to tell us. Don't get in debt, son. Don't get in debt. In reality, in this crisis, anyone with debt, with money outside Lebanon, is the net winner. Uh, and anyone who was saving money with no debt in Lebanon is the net loser. It's, that, it's a zero-sum game, and that's how it happened. Uh, so if we look at the loans that were in almost $50 billion about a year and a half ago at the height, today the loans are, I think, slightly above $20 billion, which means that's a massive, remember, we're in crisis. That's a massive amount of loan reduction. In, in a year. I mean, you, you guys in, uh, in economics and stuff, have you ever seen a country in recession pay off that much debt? So it's pretty clear this is all lolar transactions of people escaping and, and distributing losses uh, voluntarily. So the, to answer your question, when the 20, uh, 20 billion, 22 billion, when that 22 billion becomes zero or, or NPL, close to non-performing loans, yeah, meaning what's paid off is paid off and what's not going to be paid off is not paid off, then theoretically, the dollar becomes, uh, the lolar in the bank becomes effectively lira. You know, effectively it becomes lira. Okay. Um, another question from Hamad. Do you think the cryptocurrency could be a solution to solve the, uh, the crisis as it cannot be influenced by governments, by, but only by... Uh, supply and demand? I don't think it will because you have to remember that the crisis in Lebanon is related to your ability 
to transfer a dollar outside Lebanon to buy stuff. And why do you want a dollar outside Lebanon? Because you want to buy stuff. You want, you know, whether it's a car, tuition for your kid, uh, vacation, etc. Right. So well, cryptocurrency, in reality, you still need the point of entry and point of exit. And if I have you know, to buy, bit, you know, to buy Bitcoin, for example, you still need to pay for it with some type of a currency, a real currency, right? You can't pay for it with Lolar, and you can't pay, you know. So, and you, you, generally, you can't pay for it with Lira. There are exceptions, but the idea is that when you, you know, if you want to go on vacation in Turkey, okay, you need your dollar, a real dollar here, to end up in Turkey. Uh, whether you use Bitcoin as a conduit or PayPal or a credit card that's a foreign credit card or whatever, it's the same. It's the same idea. So if you have money stuck here, that's not going to escape through uh, some type of a uh, cryptocurrency. It doesn't solve. It doesn't solve that problem. Okay. Uh, Joe is asking: Do you expect a real estate crisis? I, I'm not sure what is meant by a real estate crisis. If you if you mean, do I expect prices to uh, drop, if that's the question, then uh, first of all, they've dropped already, okay? They've dropped by about two thirds, let's say. So you know, if you if today you're paying $3 million for a Lollars, check Bonquer, for a, an apartment in Lebanon, you can buy the same one for a million dollars cash today, which means effectively it's dropped two thirds from the height, right? Uh, but the question is what is gonna happen over the next year? I'll tell you what's gonna happen over the next year. So today, these are people, people buying apartments and properties today are people escaping from banks. And they, they, they're not, they were not intending to buy an apartment. They decided to buy an apartment because they're escaping from the bank, right? So uh, when, when the LOLAR is no longer taken as a medium of exchange, okay? And we've already started to see this. Notice if you want to buy an apartment now, they no longer accept a pure LOLAR check. They're saying, I want 10 or 20 or 30% in cash, right? So if we, if we look at this trend and we extrapolate and project to the future, we could see a, a scenario in a year, plus or minus, when uh, a person selling you an apartment in Lebanon will only demand cash. So now that means that the only person that can buy an apartment in Lebanon will be someone like you, an expat living overseas. Because remember, a Lebanese living in Lebanon, his or her income has dropped by 80 or 90%. So their buying power has dropped by 80 or 90%. Now let's look at expats like yourselves. If we look on average among expat Lebanese, uh, are we doing better today than we were five or 10 years ago? Uh, I'm talking bankers, et cetera. The answer is on average, we're not doing better. The second thing is if, we, if you have to buy cash and look at the people on this call, how many of you can produce $500,000 in cash? I mean, not a loan, not a scan to buy an apartment in Lebanon. So what that means is that the demand is going to drop precipitously, not because you don't want to buy an apartment, because you can't afford it. So therefore, once this LOLAR thing uh, uh, finishes, real estate, in my opinion, on top of the two thirds, will drop another two thirds. Okay. Uh, Dan, Ran, uh, Rana is an expat and she's saying all her savings are in Lebanon. Based on your experience, what, what is the worst case scenario and is waiting a good advice? Uh, well, first of all, no, waiting is not at all a good idea because, uh, let me tell you why. I mean, there's the common sense approach. First of all, historically, whenever we've waited for something to solve itself in Lebanon, it doesn't solve itself for the better. For example, the electricity supply in Lebanon. So we've had a problem since 1990. We've waited, nothing happened. So waiting in and of its own passively is not going to help. Uh, the numbers are also clear. Yani today, if you look at the numbers, Riyad Salemi has $17 billion. Okay, let me phrase it differently. Riyad Salemi has said on various occasions that he doesn't want to spend the mandatory reserve, right? The 15% of deposits, right? So what is he telling you there? He's telling you, once we reach 15%, I don't want to spend it. But, you know, reverse what he just told you. If he says, I don't want to spend the 15%, what he's telling you is he spent the 85%, right? So what that means is that out of your deposit in the bank, 85% uh, is spent, it's gone. And now we're just debating what we're going to do with the last 15%. So in other words, and what is happening with the 17.5 billion? When you look at the reports, you see it increasing or decreasing every month? It's decreasing. So if you projected a year or two in, in, in advance, that 15% that is going to be 12%, 10%, 8%, 7%. Therefore, 
uh, it's a decay. Yeah, these are the, this is the real dollars against your dollars. So in other words, it's going towards zero. Now you'd say, okay, if I wait, maybe there'll be foreign aid, blah, 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 coming in. Well, let's look at this for a second here. There's a hundred billion dollars missing between deposits and other stuff. And that's the hole, the canyon, if you want, in Lebanon. Who's going to give you a hundred billion dollars for what? And it, uh, if we take a, the, the largest, a recipient of foreign aid in the world by the United States gets 30 billion over 10 years, $3 billion. That's our neighbor to the South. Yani, what is the probability that we are gonna get uh, more money than that for any reason, <laughs> for any reason, uh, especially uh, help to bail out uh, uh, savers like you. Uh, if we look at Cyprus, Cyprus is a member of the EU. They saved anybody above uh, below 100,000 uh, every, anybody above 100 got a bail-in or a haircut. So you are, you know, Lebanon is not an EU country. So you're not going to get treated better than Cyprus. In fact, chances are you're not going to get treated the same as Cyprus because as an EU country with a 100,000 euro guarantee by the Cy Cypriot government, we don't have that in Lebanon. We had a guarantee for 5 million lira, which is $3,333. So in other words, if there's going to be some type of a bailout, meaning saving depositors, I don't see it I don't see it mathematically uh, happening at above 50 grand, and I don't see it likely to happen above even 20 grand. Does that mean then that we're going towards uh, more and more uh, evaluation of the Lebanese lira to maybe 50,000, 60,000 per dollar? If, if it depends, if the IMF comes in, they won't allow that. If the IMF comes in, they will impose the losses and, and, and the bail in or stuff like that. They, they, that's why I'm saying adult supervision. If the IMF does not come in that, and we continue the way we are, then the trend is for, a, for the devaluation to get worse. Yes. The, the, the reason the devaluation, by the way, the lira rate today, let me give you a couple of technical things. So if you go to the Saraf today to buy, uh, to sell dollars, you get 9,000 plus or minus, okay. Uh, but if you have lira in the bank, remember you can't take out as much lira as you want. So if you have a, a billion lira in the bank today, you can't take it out, right? So to take it out, you have to sell that and pay a commission. The commission today is, I don't know what the last number is, it's 10 or 15%. So that, that billion lira, you can turn it to say 900 million lira cash. And then you can go to the Sarraf. In other words, the real lira rate is something like 9,000 plus 10, 15%. Yani it's above 10,000 already. So the, the, yani the Saraf rate is artificially held low through a capital control on the Lira. The second problem is a lot of people, of course, are not doing this transaction. They're keeping it in the bank and waiting, right? But sooner or later, this, this huge, massive supply of printed Lira, sooner or later, it has, to, it has to see, you know, it has to come out. And when it comes out, you're right. That, 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 that's the type of level it can reach unless somebody uh, controls that lack of discipline of how they're solving the problem. Thank you. Um, another, yes, another question from Wael. For the person who is not an expert, neither in economics nor in finance, what are the indicators that we need to keep an eye on to understand where the economy is heading? <clears throat> okay, he, this is the interesting thing. Yeah, I, I, um, I was in a meeting the other day with some, um, the people in the government, uh, not, not the other day, a few months ago. And one of the questions that was asked by one of the ministers, he said he's worried about a Cypriot scenario happening, meaning that banks stop lending. Okay. Now, on the surface, that looks like a, a very good question, very good point. So I, I was third in line talking. The first guy answering said, uh, you know, the usual bullshit cliche, which is about. Uh, you know, the, the whole trust, trust thing. <laughs> so, and then they, some other guy gave some similar type of thing. Okay, it got to me and I'm like, okay, so what if there's no lending? Like, what do you mean? Everybody's looking at me like, what do you mean? I mean, again, the, the cliche is, uh, you know, lending creates economic activity. Economic activity means GDP growth, GDP growth good. Because again, we've all read in the same books. But what does it mean to have economic growth in a country like Lebanon that imports? It means it's, it, we get a bigger car, <laughs> we go on more vacations, it means more dollars going outside, and these dollars are, are financed by expats like you, the savings of expats like you. So in other words, what we need right now is actually the opposite of growth. We need a diet. So today, the situation we're in, the GDP shrinkage is good, 
because GDP shrinkage creates the six pack, you know, creates fitness in the country. So shrinkage of GDP, which means cutting all the imports, all the unnecessary businesses that were built on imports and brands and proprietorship, yeah, and, uh, and all that stuff. And then when, when, when lending only to businesses that create a productive, uh, uh, pr you know, production like uh, selling software, uh, stuff like that, instead of lending to buy a car, an import, a vacation, an import, iPhone, import, you see what I'm saying? So the lending in, in, the, in the past was always about stuff that ended up uh, uh, profiting companies outside the Lebanon. So to answer your question, it's okay for our GDP to shrink because this is us getting better and healthier. In the same way that when you're sick, you lie in bed and you lose weight, right? You rest and then you, 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 you get up and then you start getting more and more fit. So this is the same way. In Lebanon today, we are, our economy is very sick. We need to shrink it until it becomes efficient. And then we, we rebuild it through the survivor, survivor of the fittest and individual initiative. Uh, okay, another question from, uh, from Patrick. Uh, what do you think about the fact that uh, people that have huge deposits versus those who have small deposits are being treated the same? Although those with uh, high deposits already knew the risk given the fact that they were uh, given a high return. Yeah, I mean, this is obviously my biggest pet peeve with the solution. Uh, I don't think it's big deposits versus small deposits, by the way. I think it's super WASTA versus uh, people without WASTA. Because what's happening is you could have $100,000 today in the bank. And if you have a, a you're connected to somebody very powerful, you can get all that money out. And people have. You could have $100 million and not be able to get anything. I know a guy who, who consulted me worth $400 million living outside Lebanon. This person can no longer afford to pay the electric bill on his house outside Lebanon with $400 million. So it's not about big deposits versus little deposit, about super wasta versus... When banks were closed, okay, uh, right after October 17, there was one per... There was, uh, let me tell you what happened. $3.7 billion escaped out of Lebanon uh, with a significant amount of PEPs. One PEP, politically exposed person transferred $273 million while banks were closed and yeah, over the phone. Okay. So the problem there is the, this, the super was the, some paid commission. This guy paid a 10% commission, by the way. So it's, this was a variety of ways that people got their money out. And this, this is why to, to, to deal with this problem. And I need your help for this. Uh, we need to lobby the parliament to pass a law. The law has already been presented in December about the return of all money that escaped uh, after October 17th, okay? There's a law right there presented. All you have to do is lobby your favorite MP or actually bring in close to three or $4 billion. That's more than the IMF is gonna give you. So we, we are either passive and waiting like some one of your colleagues asked, if we wait, will something happen? If you wait and do nothing, I guarantee you, you're gonna lose more money. On the other hand, if we uh, uh, engage in activism to try to pass laws that benefit the country without regard to political parties, uh, then we have a chance to minimize losses. Losses are unavoidable, but we can minimize them and distribute them more equitably. Okay, Dan, we already talked about uh, those who have already money in, in, in banks. Salim is asking uh, for those who have deposits in, in Lebanese banks, is buying real estate in Lebanon a good option? Since we mentioned that waiting is not a good idea. No, I don't think I, I, I talked about this before. I don't think buying real estate is a good idea because like I said, once the, the, the transactions in real estate today are not real. They're not going to the end user. Yeah, and it, what, there's people buying three, four, five apartments. Uh, and this is all LOLAR checks. Once the LOLAR checks stops being taken in, in about a year and, and transactions become cash, then the, the price drop will be uh, pre precipitous. It'll be monumental and it'll be big. So the best okay. solution is two things. The best solution to LOLARs in the bank is either you take your loss, which is about two thirds today, and you, you, know, you cut your losses and get out through selling the check. Or if you want to take risk, a better way to do it is to invest in a business that has, in Lebanon, that has revenue outside. One of the things that I've talked about is a movie, for example. There's a guy, Serge Orion, who he's the guy who did that show, uh, Beirut Cities with Daniela Rahmi. 
So the idea is you do a movie, the movie gets syndicated all over the world, gets sold to Netflix or whatever, and any dollar that comes in from that goes to the investor. That's a way to take risk, employ Lebanese people, help the Lebanese economy, and you got a shot at getting your money back. But it involves risk. You could also lose. Or just take the loss and get out. But there's no, you know, like waiting and all that stuff. That's not going to bring the money back. Okay. Then I have uh, a question, if you don't mind. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, but uh, if let's say you have one hundred dollars in the bank, and you're saying that fifteen percent are actually real, like fifteen percent are in dollars. Why is it valued in the thirty percent in the black market? Uh, that's a very good question. A couple of reasons. I mean, there's, there's of course the wisdom of crowds. You know, you have to remember that the, 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 the market rate is the weighted average of thousands of transactions, thousands of people that are not necessarily analysts. They're just, you know, they're just the what's called the wisdom of crowds. But if we wanted to analyze it mathematically, okay, if you look at the Riyadh Salami has 17 billion, right? The gold is about 17, 18 billion, you know, 30, 30 something billion. Uh, so that's the do- that's those are the real dollars against the 112 billion. If you divide 35 by 112, you you get about 30 something, you know, 30 something cents. So in fact, ironically, that the thousands of transactions by people as sophisticated as you guys, PhDs in economics, and the guy without a high school degree, the the average of all those transactions comes out to be exactly what the real dollars are versus the claims against, which is kind of like a neat the trick i guess oh okay thank you thank you so much um ryan is asking as expats who don't have access to the streets what can be what can we do to put pressure to pass the claw back law uh very good question i get that a lot especially if we don't have a favorite mp in the parliament who can lobby with okay look a couple of things a couple of things here one is uh first of all I think that the biggest, yani, the biggest injustice that has happened in the country, in the, in the banking sector, is against expats. Uh, ironically, the expats are also the weakest link because they're outside, okay? They're outside, they're busy with their jobs, etc. Uh, but there's a couple of ways the expats can get involved. Number one, if you are an expat sending your mother and father or your family three, four, five hundred dollars a month, I think it's not too much to ask them to, to lobby for the law, okay? Yani, let them get off their, their uh, chair and, and start helping you out if you've got savings stuck. So that's one way of doing it. Yani, they are benefit- Expats in Lebanon are helping, are, are, are the reason yani, the country is still hasn't gone to the Venezuela scenario. So I, think, I don't think it's too much to ask from the people you're helping in Lebanon to also help themselves and help you by lobbying for a law like this. That's one way you could do it. The, the other thing I think in, in Lebanon, we do not understand our yani, economic, uh, sorry, our political, de- our democratic rights and responsibilities. We don't, we don't understand it. Yani. We think an MP is a guy you call Saad al when you see, you know, and he gets a, a reservation restaurant. The, an MP in Lebanon, which is a somewhat democratic society, is a person that represents you. You voted for the person, even if you don't, if, even if you didn't vote for the person, that MP represents you. He or she represents the district. Yani, even if you don't like that person, he or she represents you. It is your tax, your tax, your tax dollars, your tax, the taxes you pay every time you go to a restaurant to pay VAT or you take a flight and they take uh, uh, taxes on it or whatever. Uh, every, this is what pays that person's salary. It is not something that is unusual or even strange for you to call the person, the MP and tell them or ask them to pass the law or explain to you why they don't want to vote for the law and uh, demonstrate in front of his or her house if they refuse to do it. You know what I mean? They had better give you a good reason why they're not signing it. Some of them will tell you it's unconstitutional. I've heard that. Unconstitutional. So everything that's happened in the country is constitutional, including taking your money and not giving it to you. But now they're suddenly sensitive about the constitutionality of returning money that escaped uh, in a, through super wasta, you know? Uh, so that's uh, what I recommend. Uh, you, uh, the expats are rich even after the, the losses they've taken. So you can also lo- use money for lobbying. Yeah, and the ads, uh, support uh, uh, NGOs, etc. to pass these laws. There's a lot of things you can do. And this is to protect your own interest, by the way. To protect your own interest. Yeah, and your money is out there. Don't let them uh, get away with stealing it. Uh, 
especially the super wasps, especially annoying. And if there are people that withdrew billions of dollars when banks were closed and you guys were busy working in Dubai and not knowing your money stuck and these people are taking their money. Your and buddy, Dan, really. Dan, you were mentioning that probably the best solution for individuals is to, to get out as soon as possible. Don't leave your, your money in the, in the banking system. But is this possible? Can you can you withdraw? I mean, if you have a hundred thousand dollars right now, you can't. It's it's very much. It's you. You need ten years to get it out. Like, look, I'm not recommending. These are these are personal. I mean, these are personal choices. And I'm not telling people what to do. I mean, I'm just giving you the numbers. The numbers yeah. are such that uh, the the the, num the numbers are such that uh, right now, and if Riyadh Salami tomorrow morning sold all the dahab, all the gold. And distributed all the cash coming out from the gold and uh, and cash. Distributed to the depositors. Every depositor would get something like thirty three cents. And the next day, the electricity would would stop in Lebanon. Like the whole country would stop running. Planes would stop running. Electricity would stop. Everything would stop. The whole country would become Mogadishu, nineteen ninety three. So obviously, that's not a uh, and and that's why maybe that's one of the reasons why the check is being sold for one third. Of course, that's not a uh, viable solution. It's not practical to distribute all the money, right? Uh, in fact, he's already told you. He said, you, you're in Lebanon. You, why should I give you your money back in dollars? You're in Lebanon. You got it in Lira. He's told you that already. So the answer is, you, you know, I guess what your question is, if I'm getting it at 3,900 and they're limiting how much I can take, it'll take me years for to get 100,000. There is another way. You can. There are people that will buy your check as long as there are loans. Yani, there's 22 billion in loans left. Anyone who has a loan of 22 billion and has money outside Lebanon might be willing to, to or the cash might be willing to buy your account for a third plus or minus. It varies by the day, but that's about the amount. So that's how you do it. And then the other way I told you, the other way is you take your 100,000 dollar check, you invest it in a movie, and then the movie gets produced, filmed, shot, syndic sold. If it, if, it, if it does badly, you lose all your money. If it does semi well, you get some of your money back, 50 cents, let's say. And if it does really, really well, you get every last dollar, lolar back and becomes a dollar. Interesting. Um, another question without accounting for inflation, what do you think would be the lolar account fate eight to 10 years from now if no uh, reforms take place? What will they be worth? Yeah. If there's no reforms, they'll be worth they'll be worth zero in about uh, three and a half years, like zero. <laughs> because because uh, let me tell you why. There's 35 billion. So assume there's no reform. So the 17 billion are you know dropping dropping down to zero, right? So at that point in time, the parliament. I'm talking no reforms. Parliament uh, passes a law to sell the gold. So then Riyadh gets 17 billion in gold, assuming gold doesn't drop by then. So uh, 17 billion in gold, spends it. You were talking, we're losing about a billion, let's say a month, 800 million, whatever. That's another year and a half. So within three years, when the, the, the cash and the gold becomes zero, right? That means there's no deposit, it's gone. Um, another question. But that's the already... that's the worst case scenario. And in order reforms in three years, and they've sold all our wealth basically. Uh, another question already we mentioned part of it. So, what's the probability of getting our money from banks with reasonable losses within three to five years? And what could be so the solutions to be presented? Uh, we already uh, discussed this. Hey, the longer we wait, the bigger the loss. Yeah, and Anna, when I started talking about this a year and a half ago, I was talking about saving 99% of the people. And it was mathematically doable. Today, I talk about 85%, if you notice. If we have this Zoom again in a year, I'll be talking about, I don't know, 50%, 60, you know, maybe less. 50% of the people, not 50% of the money. Remember, 85% of the money is gone, right? In, in, in cash. Uh, less than that in, uh, if, we, if we count the gold. So 85, if 85% is gone, 15% is left. If you distribute the 15% on the lower echelons, you avoid those losing money. But in reality, if you do it mathematically, every person loses 85 cents, by the way. That's why there's a difference between small and big accounts. So, so then if everyone now wants to uh, take the, the deposits back, so how can we restore the confidence in the banking sector in Lebanon? 
if every one of us here has a plan to maybe uh, get back the money, even uh, with losses. It, it's not uh, it's not as hard as people think it is. Yani today, it, it, what's the problem for you today is the uncertainty. You don't know if you can get your money back or you don't, or you are right. Uh, and then it's very capricious. Yani you can some you can take out five hundred. This other guy can take one thousand. You can, the one hundred. This other guy. This is what the problem is. If the government came in and you had a credible government, yani if you had a credible minister come out and tell you, look, guys, I can't give you your money tomorrow morning, but I promise I'm going to give it to you for anyone under a hundred thousand dollars. I promise you, I, I'm, I'm putting the stamp of the Lebanese government behind it. In fact, I'm going to allow every person to withdraw 1% per month, okay, in dollars. If I say that, if I come out and say that to you, uh, uh, and you and you have under 100, so the first month you're going to test it. You'll try to withdraw 1%. I'll give it to you. Second month, 1%. If you do it for three, four, five months, after a while, you're going to be, wow, this guy is uh, real. You may stop doing it. You see what I'm saying? Uh, and then in a, in a year or two, I might allow more than 1% for you to withdraw. And, the, you know, so that's how trust is regained. Hala, what do I do for the above 100? Above 100, I'll tell them what the plan is. I'll say, look, I can't pay you above 100. We don't have the money. You're going to take it. What I'm going to do is compensate you through bank shares. That's what's called a bail-in. And it, as long as you give people a, a plan and the plan is credible and you're credible and the government is credible and the you, you show that you start implementing the plan in a credible way, you guys will trust Right? That's the problem. The if we remove the uncertainty and we establish credibility, trust can come back quickly. The important thing is to, is to tell the truth and to, uh, and, uh, yani, to carry out, uh, yani, follow through in, in, in whatever is promised. That's the most important thing. Yani, you can't tell the people, I'm going to protect 98% yani, of deposits, check, and not, and not do it. You, you, you got you to gotta promise something and show that, yani, show uh, uh, benchmarks of success, KPIs in, in business is, is what we call them. Okay. Uh, there's a question regarding taxation. So what's your opinion on Dr. Nahas wanting to tax the expats? Uh, which Dr. Nahas? Um, Sharb al-Nahas. Ah. Uh, I, I think that expats, I, I have a problem with taxing expats because Obviously, we've already taxed them <laughs> with their savings. And if anything, we need to we need to be, you know, we need to be extra nice to expats. First of all, not only did we, did we use them to live a really nice lifestyle for the last twenty years, but even today they are the ones saving the country. So we need to be very careful with uh, with the expats and how we treat them. And you know, we have we have a lot of uh, remorse, let's say, uh, and and stuff to do with the expats. Um, but let's talk about taxation in general. You reminded me of something. So one of the things, and this is not me, Nassim Talib figured this one out. Uh, a lot of people talk about the government being wasteful, and it is wasteful. There's too many employees, no question. But the primary deficit in the government is zero. We don't have a deficit. Meaning if you took out the government debt, the amount of taxes we get is enough to pay the government expenses, which, by the way, means our taxes were too high already. You know, you know what I'm saying? It's just very unusual, very strange uh, statistic to, to, to see. And, uh, and we had so many employees, yet we still are able to pay them if we took out the debt, which meant that, that you know, we were doing well in terms of taxes. Okay. Um, let me take one more question. How should bank procedures be improved to prevent future use of unethical business practices that lead to financial crisis? Uh, this is a fantastic question. So as I said, if we wanted to describe the problem in Lebanon yani, in a couple of words, it's about moral hazard. Yani, yani, it, it was all about people were making money in a way, with your money, in a way that when things were good, I became rich. When things are bad, you lost money. This is the whole system was like that. So uh, one of the ways to do it is by in, in the chain. You, know, you asked about trust as well. That's another answer, which is the fact that you, know, you need to establish an independent board that reports to an independent chairperson of the bank. So today, the chairman or chairwoman of a bank is a dictator. They can do whatever they want. So the board and the board is selected in a way that is all on the prestige of the name. Yani, if you if you look go go on uh, go on Google look up the boards you'll notice the board members of the bank is Sheikha so and so uh, so and so Basha 
Sheikh so and so. It's all about the prestige of the bank. Uh, even Carlos Ghassan is on is a board member, five percent owner of one of the banks, for example. So why did they pick him? I can guarantee you he wasn't involved in the day to day running like he should have been and telling them, hey, don't do the financial engineering. They picked him to say, well, look who we have on our board. So if you ever had a board member that questioned the C the chairman, said, hey, what are these financial engineering things you're doing? I can guarantee you they told him to be quiet or we'll kick you off the board. So the first solution is the to 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 you know, the governance model of all the banks. By the way, Lebanese law already has personal liability of board members when when banks stop paying. So again, we're not implementing existing law. So we need to start holding people accountable, and we need to redo the governance model of of of, of banking of the banking system so that we don't get a repeat of what what just happened. Okay, let me take uh, one more question. What if the law of returning money is back has been accepted, then it got, it got used to subsidy the import with all the losses that comes with it instead of paying back 80% of the depositors? And how do you read the Swiss lawsuit against the governor? Will it be followed by other lawsuits against other PEPs? And will it lead to something positive? This will be, I guess, the last question. Okay, so the clawback, <laughs> you know, to me, the clawback is, is all about the positives. So I, you know, I, I agree with your concern, but no, I think that the, 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 what I'm trying to do with this law is for the clawbacks to happen and the, and the money uh, being, to, uh, you know, being there to, to compensate the depositors, simple as that. It's their money. It's literally their money. So no, I don't think it should be allocated to anything else. Uh, and the, I, you know, my view on, on, on subsidies, anyhow, on the, on the, the accusations against the governor, I, I don't normally get into, you know, the personal stuff. So we don't know, we don't really know what exactly are the charges. I've heard rumors about a 400 million transfer, uh, you know, and stuff like that. I don't think it's a systemic thing for, for one thing. I don't think it's like, oh, my, okay, this is, this is the start of investigating every single pep in Lebanon. Okay. I can guarantee you that's not it. It's not a Swiss thing to do that anyhow. The, the, the Swiss are not in the business of going into another country and trying to uh, uh, reform it. I think there was, there are, there, what we do know there are some accusations, there's some type of transaction that was flagged for whatever reason by the Swiss related to the governor. Of course, we believe that someone is innocent until proven guilty. Uh, so I'm not going to comment based on rumors and stuff like that. But if if it's true that a transfer that large happened by a person who was a public servant for the last 28 years, obviously that then that raises eyebrows for, you know, not just the Swiss, it should be for us as well, because there's no, I mean, Alan Greenspan, in fact, if you look at the net worth of the last three or four governors of the, of the Federal Reserve, you know, the Central Bank of the United States with a $7 trillion balance sheet, their net worth, maybe $20 million. Yellen, the last one, her net worth and her husband's are together $20 million. Her husband is a Nobel Prize winner in economics. So their net worth combined is 20 million. Uh, the Volcker, Volcker, the one of the best governors, his net worth 20 million, something like that. So uh, I don't think it's reasonable to, to have a, you know, a country as small as Lebanon uh, with a, with, you know, if the numbers are true, it, 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 it's probably not great, let's just say. Okay. Um, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Dan. You, you, you um, want me to take uh, Elisar's uh, you want yeah, to take Elisar's, like, uh, thing? Yeah, yeah let, me, let me leave it. If you'd like to finish on a positive note, what will be? And how do you perceive the economic future at short run uh, for those who live there? What do you recommend to the poor and middle class society to live in a decent way in the current circumstances? And with the high level of waste that is rooted in the lowest to the highest level of morals and institutions. Type. So the positive note is this. Our the problem is technically simple to solve. And if we compare the problem today to the problem in 1990 at the end of the war, the, the problem at the end of the war, we had devaluation, same as now. We also had the whole country. You see the port explosion? The whole country was like that. The whole country was broken. Mines everywhere. And I live in Ashrafi. Behind me here, 500 meters away was, was the green line, full of mines, people shooting at you. Everything was broken down. Uh, so it was a much, much more complex problem and much more real problem. Today, the problem in Lebanon, the whole problem is paper. 
يعني it's a, it's a virtual man-made construction. There's nothing real about it. The country is pretty built up. You could look behind me at the buildings. Uh, the, the whole issue is the fact that there are too many claims against the real cash. Uh, that's what's creating the problem. So if you distribute the losses, boom, game over, the problem solved, and we can start growing again. Uh, the other good news is you guys. You guys are going to be the ones, hopefully, and in most scenarios, 95% probability, are going to prevent us going to the Mogadishu 1993 scenario because of the money that you're sending to your family in Lebanon. That's the good news. Allah. The bad news is that in Lebanon, the standard of living, you know, the losses have been distributed already over not just the poor, as you know, people concentrate a lot on the fact that the poverty line is below. But in reality, the, 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 you know, the huge people that lost a lot of money are the very rich have lost a lot of money and the middle class have lost. And you know, the biggest, I think, loser is the middle class. Because remember, unemployment in Lebanon was 30% before the crisis. What does unemployment being 30% mean? These 30% of the people were earning zero. So if you're earning zero when the lira is 1,500 or earning zero when the lira is 10,000, you're still earning zero. So I think that we, we, what we're missing here is the, the, the damage that was done to the middle class, upper middle class, and even the elite in Lebanon with this whole thing. Not that I'm empathizing with the elite, but what I'm saying is from an economic perspective, that's actually where the damage was done. Because if the Gini index was high, and 6,000 people, 0.3% owned more than 50% of the deposits and the deposits are gone, that's where the loss is, right? So in some ways, that is also a key to the solution. So the key to the solution is the distribution of losses among the 0.3%, thereby trying to avoid the four, four and a half million people from losing their, you know, from also losing as much. So the solution is actually simple. That's the good news, provided you have a competent government willing to make decisions and supported by the parliament. Thank you, Dan. Uh, I'm sure everyone here uh, enjoyed the, the lecture, and I hope we can have another session sometime soon. <laughs> Thank you so much Thank for inviting so me. Much. You're welcome, Dan. Also, thanks everyone, uh, those who joined. Also, thank you, Dr. Asad. Thank you, Dan, and thank you, myself. This was a great lecture. Thank you. Thank you all. Ciao. Bye. Bye-bye.